at night. But when I came home one night, it was about four in the morning, and I'm laying in bed, and I start shaking. And I said, hey, kid, I think we got a problem here. She's like, stop, you're scaring me, you're shaking. And I couldn't stop. So right away, you think of Parkinson's, and I don't know, it just popped into my head. And you go to the hospital, and they put all these wires, and they do all these tests. <laughs> And I guess nobody wanted to face me and tell me that I had Parkinson. So every doctor that would come by, I'd be like, the next guy's going to see you. The next guy's going to see you. <laughs> Till finally, some guy, some heavy accent, I don't even know, peeks his head in. And he goes, you know what you got, right? This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. 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 sailing along the open water, having a great time. The seas are calm, the wind is light, and there's not a cloud in the sky. The ship is moving forward, heading towards the horizon. In an instant, and out of nowhere, a storm approaches, and we fall into crisis mode. There is no control, and we are helpless at the hands of Mother Nature. All that can be done is to prepare and hang on for dear life. Our life is sometimes smooth seas and calm sailing. There are other moments when we're blindsided by troubles beyond our control. With very little hope, all we can do is hang on until rescue arrives. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felace, and welcome to The Suffering Podcast. If you're a fan of overcoming adversity and overcoming suffering, then we're for you, because that's what we do here, and that's the stories that we highlight. So do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, please comment, and now you can join. Ring the bell so you can get notified of all of our new content and follow us on social media so you can find out what we're up to. On today's episode of The Suffering Podcast, we welcome the movie stars in here. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, J.C. Capone and What's Stuart up? Chiracella. Wow, good job. Good job. Did it. Three wow, years to, to get that name, brother. Job, Three man. years. That was awesome. You know, what you're going to find out about these two men is not only are they prolific in the entertainment industry, but J.C. is overcoming a battle that very few people can understand. Before we get into anything, let's give a big shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody as police, but we do trust them. So go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. So guys, every week, Stu, you've been, you're an old timer. I mean, you're a veteran here. Nothing's it's, really changed except for the Hoboken, cameras. Our Hoboken connections. Now. Yeah. Listen. Could I just say these guys came a million miles away? It was just audio when I was here. We have video now. This is the big leagues. Well, Whoever's show, out there. Your show blew up so much we made a ton yeah. of cash, so we yeah. bought a studio. Yeah. <laughs> so each week, JC, we take a we take a question from our audience. This week's question comes from Kitty Cat, and it says, "Why is there suffering and pain in the world?" JC. I want you to lead this one off. What do you think? You need to go through pain, lots of pain, to figure out when you get to the promised land, the heavier the pain, the greater the miracle. I love that, dude. Yeah. Stewie, what do you think? Me personally, I needed what I went through as a kid. I needed what I went through with my addiction to be the person I am today. You know, you often say, oh, look at these people. They, they're here, they're there, they're there in their life all my age. But I had to be and go through whatever I had to go through. So I had to learn how to help people. You know, and that's just basically it. Mike? That's all. I, th I think the pain and suffering keeps you grounded. You know, you're just, if you got given everything in your life, you wouldn't appreciate anything. So, you know, going through that pain and suffering, you appreciate, like I said before, I appreciate every day now. So there's a lot of different theories on why there's pain and suffering. You know, people who believe in God or a God, they'll say, well, if God's so good, then why do you put pain and suffering? There's some theories out there, and it's a, it's a Jewish theory that says that God created the world and then separated himself because if he was always present, then it wouldn't be anything miraculous. There would be no faith. It would just be reality. Okay. I believe that there would be no good without pain and suffering because it would just be reality. So I gravitate towards that theory a little bit more. Um, there is no back to the front. Taoists have that principle. Christianity, you got to have faith in order to, to reach a, a higher level you got to know the pain. you got to know the suffering. And people of faith, they're, who's, the, who's your major sufferer? Like he's, he's J.C. is J. Jesus in the house. J.C. Capone Everybody right here, baby. J.C. J.C. You know Capone. Jesus' son right next to me. J.C. Capone, baby. We so I believe suffering and pain, while it sucks, it is absolutely 100% necessary. 
But I know. So, Kitty Cat, thank you so much for sending that one in. Keep sending in your questions, and we will try to get on the air. I didn't even tell everybody why JC is in the house tonight. Why? That's going to be the suffering of Parkinson's. You know, everybody sort of knows what Parkinson's is. They've heard of it. But when you come face to face with Parkinson's, you know, everybody sees Michael J. Fox, Back to the Future, Family Ties. And now you see him today, and everybody has this, this almost pity of him. But when you hear him talk, man, he's got one of the greatest attitudes, and I see that in you, JC. I see that in you. you. Know, uh, yeah. Attitude takes a long time to get crocodile skin to battle this disease. And I'm sure I, it wasn't always like that, though. I was in a deep depression for three years. I locked myself in a room because I was embarrassed to see people. And the minute you stop living, the minute you lock that door and you don't go outside the house, you already started dying. So we ain't dying. We're going to live a long time and a good time. That's a great attitude to have. Because the minute, you, the minute you pass on, how do you know they're not going to find some sort of cure for this or some sort of medication? You know, you just missed it by one day. That's what kind of keeps everybody going. You know, but, you know, when you're growing up, where'd you grow up, by the way? Five towns, Lawrence. And where, where was that? Lawrence, New York. Lawrence, New York. Good neighborhood, good yeah. family. Good family. Old school Italian, pasta on Sundays, meatballs. <laughs> my mama would hit you with us. My mother would be able, she would have the clog. So when we were bad, we'd turn the corner. She'd throw them things like boomerang. <laughs> they hit you in the head and come right back. See, what, what people don't understand, a wooden spoon wasn't for stirring the, you know, nah. stirring the pasta for and all that. Whoopings. It was for ass whoopings. Exactly. The metal spoon was worse. <laughs> so I got the, I, I remember one year, my brother. Now, I didn't grow up in an Italian household, but I trust me, I got the spoon. One year, my brother, who was Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, wanted to get my mother one of these decorative spoons that hang on the wall. I go, bro, you're going to fucking kill me. <laughs> you, like, that's a, that's a true weapon. Because my mother, and when the, the, the spoon wasn't enough, it was the, it was the uh, broomstick. And my, my mother was four feet nine tall. But man, she came with some fury. She was like a Forget about it. My mother taught Darth Vader how to sword fight. <laughs> I just want to let you know. So what was it like growing up? Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Life was beautiful. My father was around, my mother... Um, my family lived within like 10 minutes of each other because we were all basically immigrants from Italy, so we stayed close. Family was tired. Every holiday we had 30, 40 cousins and aunts and uncles at the house. There was no such thing as secondhand smoke the fucking Christmas day. <laughs> There'd be clouds of smoke. You'd have to duck underneath the wall just to not get hit with a cloud. With the yellow ceilings. Yeah, yellow ceilings, ashtrays all over. Remember those big glass ashtrays? Yeah, so, stand up once. Italian household. Pool table downstairs, second kitchen. Second kitchen, we didn't even know the first kitchen. That was for diplomats only. <laughs> Plastic slip covers. We had slip the covers office room. Only slip covers the on the couch. Only yeah. when Italian dignitaries came to yeah. visit, you were able to get in that room. Yeah. <laughs> the, pla the plastic runners on the rug. My mother had a velour couch, green velour. Yeah. The thing turned purple after so many years of the plastic being on. 95 degrees, you're sitting yeah. on plastic. Damn, boy, your ass would hurt. And when your you get ass, up, your ass sticks to the seat. You get up, you hear the skin just yeah. separate. And a lot of people don't know that's a portal. Puerto Rican thing too. That's a Puerto Rican and Italian thing right there with the the the, uh, the plastic. He's the man you want to talk That's to. Plastic Drew. on a couch too. I grew, we grew up in Hoboken. All up the Puerto Ricans and Italians have plastic on the couches. That was it. <laughs> that with, was it. With the room that nobody ever went into. No, no. Yeah. that was no. the Oval Office. No. The Oval Office. No. They had security trip alarms. My mother would know. She would be outside. She'd hear the trip alarm go mm -hmm. off. Come inside, John. Get out of that fucking room. <laughs> <laughs> like Jesus, man! What do you got a triple on? <laughs> so, so were you a sports guy, hang around guy, getting into trouble? What were you? Uh, what were you like? I wasn't a troublemaker, but I, trouble always kind of finds us. <laughs> but I wasn't a troublemaker. And uh, as far as sports go, I didn't like to be told what to do too much, so we didn't play too much sports. We just hung around, played cards, went fishing. Yeah, shit like that. Well, I know Stewie, you 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 went down that path. But you were a sports guy, though. I love to play because of the fact my father, you know, my father had me out there track first every season, basketball, football, baseball. It was just it was nonstop. It was just, you know, and then the bats and balls went away and we started, you know, getting high. <laughs> well, isn't that the way? I, I don't know what it's like in, in New York, but in Jersey, when you don't have the sports, man, an idle mind is the devil's playground. There's not much to do. Yeah. yeah. 
That's that's your quote. I stole it from you. So. Yeah, no doubt. My father made sure he found something to do. <laughs> Get up and cut of the grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't water the lawn. My father, yo, Saturday morning, be like, what do you think, you going to sleep on the couch all day? Come with me, son. Were your parents green orange? Yeah. yeah no kidding. Yeah. So for those people who are listening outside of the New York metropolitan area, a greenhorn is right Zip off the boat. Is right off the boat. Right off the boat so, from Italy. Don't say the other G word. The other G word is no good, though. Girl? What's the other G word? You talking about grease ball? Guinea. 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 <laughs> Greenhorn's acceptable. Guinea, no good. G- well, g- <laughs> so a guinea, a guinea could call someone a guinea, <laughs> yeah. you know. But I married one. Does that count? Yeah. <laughs> it's time to injection. Yeah, exactly. I was just wor- gonna say that. Worst fight, yeah. worst fight I ever got into with my wife. I used the G word, and yeah. I got that from the Godfather. Worst than the C word. I got that from the Godfather. <laughs> but funny story about the word that word. So when they were making the Godfather, Joe Colombo was still alive when they were going through script revisions, and he made sure that that word yeah. wasn't yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah, the yeah, only yeah. person that could say it was. Um, uh, Charlie Shire? No, the, uh, Carlo. Uh, oh, Carlo, yeah, 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 um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, can't think of his name right now. Uh, because he was Frank Colombo's errand boy, and he didn't say that word until yeah. Colombo got shot. That happened yeah, 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 after yeah, yeah, Colombo yeah, yeah. got That's shot. Crazy, yeah. yeah. Guinea Bassett called yeah. Charlie Shire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Guinea, Guinea Princess, I think it was. But anyway, mm. so you go through high school, pretty successful. Now, I know you had a real successful construction business. Yeah, everything... It was going real well. I what was, kind of construction? I was in the construction. We did masonry work, stucco, brick siding, stone facing, driveways, patios, decks. In a family business, or did you start it up? No, I started it up. It was uh, it was funny. I kind of got it over a card game, if you believe that or not. But <laughs> I was in the cafe, and uh, the degenerate gambler, and he kind of owed me, so we took over the business. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they miss? Wasn't that in Goodfellas too? <laughs> no, I don't know about no, Goodfellas, no. but I could tell you. But all my life, I told everybody I was in construction anyway, so it kind of fit the bill. <laughs> so when I got the business, everybody knew I was in construction. <laughs> it was like, all right. He's oh, so construction. that's your business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Everybody went, he wasn't lying. He really <laughs> is in construction. But, uh, how many years, JC? How many years? I had it for business? about 15 years, wow. 20 years. Now, that did, was about 25 we started. You had all your family members around you. Did you ever have any experience with Parkinson's? Anybody in your family ever get it? No. No? This, uh, this disease just snuck up on me one night. Well, the, yeah. s- stop there. How? What was the first hint that something was going you know, on? Um, when you work construction and you're a lifter, every day you feel aches and pains, your body's shaking, you know, you're hanging up. Jack hammers all day, yeah. you're swinging sledgehammers. I know So it's well. normal that your body's off a little bit at night. But when I came home one night, it was about four in the morning, and I'm laying in bed, and I start shaking. And I said, hey, kid, I think we got a problem here. She's like, stop, you're scaring me, you're shaking. And I couldn't stop. So right away you think of Parkinson's thing. I don't know, it just popped into my head and go to the hospital and they put all these wires and they do all these tests. And I guess nobody wanted to face me and tell me that I had Parkinson. So every doctor I would come by, I'd be like, the next guy's going to see you, the next guy's going to see you. Till finally, some guy, some heavy accent, I don't even know, peeks his head in and he goes, you know what you got, right? And I said, no, what does he got? He said, you got Parkinson's. Well, you're an Italian guy that owns a construction company. They didn't want to come in and tell you. Yeah, no, they were. Yeah, they were. Uh, they were a little shook, but. JC had two guys outside the room yeah. like this, like chilling. I was. Uh, now, over time, you, caught off guard on that. You've had to become very educated on Parkinson's. For for everybody who, mm-hmm. everybody's heard the word Parkinson's. Tell me exactly what Parkinson's does. What is it? For everybody, it's different. People have different stages and different forms. So there's mild forms of Parkinson's out there. This hand shakes, this hand locks, and my left leg drags. 
So I try to do a fucking email or text. Or, <laughs> because this guy's calling me. I'm pressing the button. I'm reaching Tokyo or China. <laughs> I don't know. I press so many buttons. My iPhone goes out of whack. So that's why you're not answering any of my that's text messages. That's why he understands. Nah, nah, nah. He got me trying to hit me today. I'm on a GPS. I said, Come on, I can't do fucking face talk right now. He's like, I can't hear you. My hand shaking, the fucking phone's going this way, that way. I'm trying to get it next to my ear. Stu yeah. calls me the other day, and he's like, you're going to send me the address? And I got I sent it to JC, and he goes, that motherfucker don't say he hasn't answered a, He hasn't answered a text message in 10 years. The only thing I'm good for, shakedown. <laughs> somebody got to shake him down, I'll shake What's your line? Sh- Give him your famous I'll line. Sh- I'll shake the shit out no, of No, 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 your famous line. What? I'm shaking, not stirred. Shaking, shaking not, not stirred, shaking, baby. Shaking, not stirred. That's it. That's but classic. I'll tell you, you don't need a KitchenAid in my house. Wow, <laughs> wow. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, but I what, make the best lemon meringue. So, so <laughs> Parkinson's affects the nerve system, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, but it affects everybody differently. Where does it stem from? Have they ever figured out why it's happening? There's so many theories out there. They could put a fucking man on the space station for ten years, but they can't figure out how to stop somebody from yeah. trembling. And the, the meds that they give you only mask the disease. There's no cure out there, so. If anybody says they got a good grasp on it, if there's no cure, they don't understand it really, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you kind of, kind of gives you a gut check. Because before, we were talking about pain. And it makes you realize how much pain you could actually withstand. Because there's days where I'm flopping on the floor like a fish out of water. And then at the end of the day, I'm working out or I'm moving or I'm seeing somebody or acting in a movie. And you say, man, I could do this even though I'm in this condition. And to me, every day is a blessing. Every day is a miracle. And uh, don't take anything for granted. See, the most important thing is taking shit for granted. Like when you get up, I say, thank God if I can move. My hands are not shaking. If I could get dressed on my own, if I could go get a cup of coffee, I drink a cup of coffee right now. The fucking thing will hit the ceiling. <laughs> It'll be a cappuccino by the time I'm finished. With it. Yeah, but it it wakes you up to the good times. So the pain that you endure wakes you up to the good times. Definitely. Yeah. So now, how old were you when you got diagnosed? I was forty. Thirty nine and a half. You're thirty nine and a half. How old are you now? Forty seven. Damn, he oh. fucking Parkinson's must de-age you or something. I know. Hey, look, he's got, he's got no wrinkles, no nothing. No, no the guy said a good to me, shot of Capone's good he side. Says, uh, <laughs> this guy says, he says, you can might shake, but thank God you're handsome. I said, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Maybe he was hitting uh, on you. Yeah, yeah, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a banana. <laughs> I go all night. Why do you think I'm still married? <laughs> well, don't ever answer those ads for a free banana cleaning. No. <laughs> okay. So when you first found out, when you first, you go home from the hospital, you get this diagnosis, right. did you go get another check? Did you, what, what was the next move? For the first six months, you're in denial. You're like, it can't be. I'm working out. I'm taking my vitamins. We grew up in a household where you didn't do drugs. We didn't drink. We didn't do smoke cigarettes, but that was it, cigars. And to get Parkinson's came out of left field, so... You're like, yeah, it's probably just a pinched nerve or something. I'll work it off, like everything else that I used to do. And it wasn't stopping. So after six months, you go check out another person and another person, and you're trying to hear a different answer. And it's always the same answer. It's Parkinson's. So. That's the Italian in you. You ask the question until you get the answer you want. The, uh, The hardest time with Parkinson's. There's two events that I remember. The first one, when I knew for sure it was Parkinson's, and I went to my dad's house, and I was walking in, and I was shaky. And now me and my old man were tight. And he started to cry because he saw his little boy have Parkinson's. Good job. Bro. And that, that kills you. And so... My father was battling cancer, so I didn't want him to worry about my fight. So I just go home and I don't see him for like two years because I didn't want to put an extra burden on him. And that's the first time. Second time, my son was born at 4.2 pounds, seven weeks early. 
He first comes out of the womb. And the father's customary that he cuts the cord and holds them. The nurse goes, I don't think you should hold them, sir. God forbid you drop them or something. So I didn't hold my son or cuddle with him or anything for the first nine months of his life because he was too small. And so now, finally, we're getting that father-son bonding, you know, but it took almost three years to get there. That, my friend, might be the most amount of suffering for a father to not be able to, to bond with their child that I've ever heard. And I've heard some awful stories in this studio. You want to talk about pain? That's some real pain right there. You're real a strong pain. man. That's got to be tough. Yeah. That's got to be tough. Um, so physically, as far as other than other than the signs of shaking, what kind of pain does your body feel because of Parkinson's? 